Sweden, a land of mystery, beauty, and absolutely mind-blowing dichotomies. A land that has simultaneously given us boring square cars and cutting-edge military hardware, shitty pop music, and the greatest band in history, Sabaton. Join me today as I look at one of Sweden's stranger claims to fame, the STRV-103. Welcome back to another episode of A Tanker's View with me, Tony, your average tanker. Today, at more viewer requests, I'm going to look at the long-serving domestically produced Swedish S-Tank. Being such a strange tank, we need to understand where it came from, so we'll look at a little history, its design, and how it was intended to be used. But before we go there, if I could get you to do the YouTube thing, like, comment, and tap that old subscribe button, I would really appreciate it. It really does help me in the algorithm. And as always, thank you again for watching. With my shameless e-begging out of the way, let us begin. So let's get the blindingly obvious out of the way. The STRV looks nothing like most of its second generation contemporaries. And I'd say it's pretty obvious why. The complete and utter lack of turret. Most people would say this makes it a tank destroyer and not a tank. And well, you'd be kind of right and also kind of wrong. Most tank destroyers of this configuration use case-mated guns. The 103s is fixed entirely in position. Yes, this is a flimsy and rather nitpicky, but according to the Swedish, its intended use and doctrine was to be that of a main battle tank. So, we'll take them at their word and refer to it as that for now. But why did they go this way? Well, you see, there was this 50-year-long dick measuring contest called the Cold War. You might have heard of it before. It was between the Warsaw Pact nations and NATO, democracy and communism, and guess who won? Seeing as I'm not rotting away in some gulag, you better believe it was barbecue and beer. Capitalism Kool-Aid manned straight through the Berlin Wall and took a steaming, star-spangled red, white, and blue turd right on Gorbachev's desk. And of course, during all of this, Sweden was declared ostensibly neutral. They still leaned heavily towards NATO, given that they were in Europe and this was initially reflected in their weapons procurement of the government. Originally, Sweden had centurions, which, relatively speaking at the time, were tall British boys, and some of the best ones. And to put a pin in that, we'll bring it up later. However, Sweden decided smartly to boost their own industrial capacity and self-sufficiency, so they chose the Alternative S, which stands for Alternative Swedish, oddly enough. As opposed to their two other options, T for French and German for some reason, and A for Anglo-American, which makes a little more sense. When they were discussing which way they would go to replace their centurions, now I'm going to point out they didn't immediately replace the centurions, and for years after the 103 came into service, they served side by side, and well, many parts of the former even made their way into the latter. So, the Swedes looked at what they would be facing, what they had, and what worked. They took data from the recent Korean War in terms of how engagements were fought and what the most amount of tank casualties were. The data showed the taller you were, the harder it was to maintain a hull down position and therefore still had a big silhouette and what we call in the business a big effing target on your back. It all boiled down to if they removed the turret, they could save weight, overall height, giving the crew added survivability. They looked at previous vehicles and took the institutional knowledge they had and came up with, well, what can only really be described as a doorstop on tracks. Operated by a crew of three, can nominally be operated by a crew of one, but it's very difficult. And so they've got a driver gunner, a commander, and a secondary driver radio man slash medic. It's got an auto loader that fires up to 15 rounds a minute, and two engines, yes, count them two, pretty unique for the time. One for aiming and driving in low gear, and the other one for high speed shenanigans. And now the primary driver, he obviously controls the pitch of the vehicle and aims the gun, positioning the tank. The reason for this was the Swedes erroneously assumed that no innovation would occur in the near future in gun stabilization technology. So the tank has to be stationary to fire. Not exactly off to a great start, but thanks to its unique design, stabilization would likely never need to be an issue. Now let's talk gunnery. 
The primary gun of the S tank is the same 105mm gun as the Centurion, but 1.2 meters longer. This is to achieve better velocity and penetration with the ammunition. This also allowed them to leverage their already vast stocks of 105mm ammunition. A very S smart move. Brumps. I'll see myself out. But seriously, it was a very prudent move from the Swedish Ministry of Defense. The gun was fed by an autoloader capable of maintaining 15 to 17 rounds a minute and by all accounts was extraordinarily reliable. I reached out to former STRV 103C commander Lars Gillenhall for some questions about the autoloader system and he was most kind enough to actually answer my questions. Both the driver and tank commander can select different ammunition types from the rack. It has a laser rangefinder to assist in ranging shots. Now, I would assume that the gunnery reticle has a ballistic gradient on it to assist with leading targets. I honestly looked high and low for three days, I combed the War Thunder forums, and no one has a picture of the reticle, which is supremely frustrating. Mostly because I wanted to know as well. And it's not like War Thunder is exactly handing out press accounts these days. <clears throat> War Thunder, Gaijin, just, just saying. But I also found out kind of why um, this morning, as of recording this uh, video that I guess the original War Thunder STRV-103 tank when sniper mode would vibrate so violently that you really couldn't see what the reticle looked like. Anyways, the gun is aimed using a precision gas hydraulic hydropneumatic suspension which can elevate or depress the whole chassis with ease. I'm informed that the switch between driving and gunning can be done very seamlessly despite how War Thunder nerfs them again. Now, moving on, it's got two coaxial mounts to the left of the driver. However, they're mounted externally on the hull of the tank. This would make reloading in combat dicey to say the least, but likely not insurmountable. The commander also has a pencil-mounted machine gun from which to engage targets as well. Now, the unique thing that makes this tank so S-special is that it elevates and depresses the whole suspension to give the tank greater elevation and depression than most of its contemporaries, as well as angle on the armor and which despite the limitations of a fixed gun system, provides an additional tactical flexibility when engaging targets. Now, the second part of this s system, okay, uh, that's it, I'm done with that joke, I swear, is its hull configuration, which I'm sure I've said enough in this video is unique. But it also includes several innovation in armor protection and driving to leverage maximum armor protection aimed at the enemy. So, I'll start with the most obvious part, the Glacius. One in four S-Tanks have a dozer blade affixed to the front of it which can be deployed hydraulically for engineering activities. The top of the Glacius has a ribbed plates which are spaced armor. These are designed to assist in deflection of incoming ordnance. All of the ammunition of course is stored in the rear, but with a caveat. The rear never gets to face the enemy because this thing drives just as fast backwards as it does forwards and the secondary driver is positioned in such a way that it allows for the ease of reversing. In other words, he's sitting facing backwards the entire time. And finally, looking at its exterior, we see several things that look just a little bit odd, but serve a good purpose. Its side skirts at first look like plate armor or slat or reactive armor rather, until you realize that they're all in fact jerry cans. Nominally to store fuel, but I imagine certain numbers of them were for coolant or oils required to top up the engines as needed. Now, I know you're thinking, why would you put all the spicy water on the outside of your hull? First, if they take a hit, at best case scenario, you've got a new pasta colander, and worst case, it catches fire. Oh well, you're inside a tank. A jerry can exploding just outside your tank is likely to be more of an annoyance than an actual danger to the crew. And it also has an interesting slat armor system that was kept secret and only to be mounted in wartime. Now, if you don't know what slat armor is, it's what we call standoff or passive armor. If a heat round or high explosive anti-tank round comes your way in the form of a tank round or RPG, it detonates against the cage, which is far enough back from the actual armor that the jet of molten copper loses coherence and cannot effectively penetrate the armor. Think of it like this, like throwing a cream pie, giggity, at a screen door. Sure, the screen is going to tear and get damaged, and the person behind it is going to get a little bit of cream on them, but it won't be a full pie to the face, giggity. And finally, this is amphibious, with as little as 20 minutes of prep time. Funny thing about swimming this beast, though, is you do it from the outside, as everyone clings to the inside of the floating skirts as it lets the tracks paddle it along the water, while the driver controls it using pull strings. 
Yes, you heard that correctly. Pull strings. Absolutely ducky. And props to these guys for pulling it off. We never got to practice fording while I was still in. Something about the environment, safety, seals being worn out, etc. Finally, while this was never battle tested, it was comparable to all of its western contemporaries, as well as being low profile as its likely adversary the T-62 at the time. And with its unorthodox doctrine of always keeping the glaciers aimed at the enemy at all times, even while falling back, which could be done at speed, it ensured that the western philosophy of crew survivability, knowing that they couldn't match their adversaries' numbers. And given the terrain it was designed to be used in, this likely would have been very, very successful. But we probably should be fortunate it was never tested in battle because that would mean a world-ending war. And that's, well, no bueno. Anyways, guys, that's going to be it for me this time. If you like the content, please, again, feel free to like the video, give me a subscription, uh, and maybe leave me a comment down below. Again, it really does help me. Thank you all again for watching. I really appreciate it. If you made it this far, you are an absolute legend. And I am working on a way to, or rather, I'm working on an Instagram account so you guys can tag me on that with your own cursed tanks that I can rip new ones. With that, guys, I will see you next time.